thousands, everybody's vampires. It's vampire movies, vampire hunter, vampire this, vampire that. It was a big deal during that period of time. And during the first century, when Jesus is walking around, angels are a big deal. Angelology was, was being pushed by all these different groups. For example, the Greeks had their myth of the destruction of Titans by Zeus. Zoastrianism. They had the fall of the angels in their mythology. And then the rabbis were, were using Genesis 6-1, if you're taking notes, Genesis 6-1 in your notes. They were using Genesis 6-1 to argue for the purpose of the angels. But it wasn't just, hey, we really are enjoying angels. They were trying to, dis they were trying to argue for why God and evil could coexist in the world. And they were using angels to do it. But here's the thing. We need to be very careful. Because though Jude uses the book of Enoch, which is an extra biblical text, though he uses the book of Enoch, it doesn't necessarily mean that he believes that that story is true. He may have been using the book of Enoch as an example of current literature, like I did of Twilight, two seconds ago. I, use, I threw Twilight in there on purpose because, it's, let's be honest, it's weird. But no one here is going to go, well, Pastor Joshua believes in vampires. And to be honest, we're Team Jacob anyway, right? My wife, it's weird, babe. But the thing is, is that it's, it's not that. It's not the reason. It was actually a theological reason. So if you guys are interested, I encourage you to read the book of Enoch. But here, let's look at Dr. Green says this. Jude does not necessarily endorse its truth, talking about Enoch. He does, however, like any shrewd preacher, use the current language and thought forms of his day in order to bring home to his readers, in terms highly significant to them, the perils of lust and pride. It may very well be that he doesn't believe the story, he's just using it as an example like I would Zeus. Doesn't mean I believe in Zeus. But this is hotly debated. I read, in preparation for the study of Jude, I've been reading multiple books, and I've been reading books that adamantly believe that the story of Enoch is 100% true. It's a reflection of the book of Genesis, without a doubt, true. There's the other side that's like, no, it's, it's figurative, it's metaphorical, it's, it's not literal. It doesn't matter for our study. And I want you guys to know, too, if you are interested, we have a copy of the book of Enoch in our library that any of our members are welcome to, to borrow. But also, if you go to our website under resources, all of the texts that I'm going to be quoting, Assumption of Moses is another text that Jude uses, Book of Enoch is another book, those are on our resources page on our website for free. You can download it, read it on your phone, read it on your tablet, read it on your computer. So if you want to just kind of understand what Jude is quoting, feel free to check that out. I encourage you guys just to take the time. But here's the story. So the story goes that each nation, God created the world, and each nation was given its own angel. And that angel was the prince over that nation. But then what happened is, as this power, this power, the angels allowed this power to corrupt them. And then what happened is we have this civil war in heaven. And that's what the book of Enoch talks about, the civil war. And then we see this imagery in Revelation as well as, as Michael fights with the, with the devil and there's all these kinds of things happening and he's cast out of heaven. Then the fallen angels, they become the demons. And this is where Jude, we see in the Jude text here, he has kept with eternal chains and darkness for the judgment of that great day the angels who did not keep their position. That's what he's referencing. So feel free to put in there the book of Enoch in your Bible right next to that text. If you have a, a nicer Bible, you might actually look down and see there's a number or a letter, and it'll actually give you the reference in Enoch, because that's what he's quoting here. But what was it the angels did? It doesn't really tell us right here. They, they abandoned their position, deserted their proper dwelling. Well, what happened was, according to the account of Enoch, is that the angels were living on earth, governing, and then they saw the daughters of men and came fatuated with them. Justin Martyr is a first century Christian, and he firmly believes that this is true. And he says this, God appointed all things under heaven to the angels, but the angels transgressed that appointment and were captivated by the love of women. And then they had children who are now called the demons. And among them, the demons sowed murder and war and adultery, all kinds of intemperate deeds and wickedness. It was the angels 
trying to have sex with the women on earth, that was their transgression. And that's how the story goes. And then if you go online, they're called the Nephilim. So if you go online, you'll see these pictures of the Nephilim. And you'll see more pictures of the Nephilim. And you see these giant, these giant uh, bones structures and all these people like wiping away the dirt. And you see these giant skeletons and all this kind of stuff. And Christians will post this stuff to their Facebook page and Instagram and be like, look, that's a Nephilim. And it's a conspiracy. They're trying to hide it. False. Christians make this mistake all the time. We're very quick to prove angels exist and to prove the Bible exists. And praise God, that's awesome. But we cannot be trusting this kind of evidence online because this is actually all false. These are all fake pictures. And when you post that to your page or your Instagram, you look foolish by saying, look it, I'm basing my faith on this, and here's the reality of it. This is a lie. I'm not a scholar or a Photoshop professor, but when I put these pictures together, I notice something. That's the exact same skull in two of the pictures. Like I said, I, I'm not professional or anything, but it didn't take me long to go, it's the exact same skull. Two different locations. The point is that this was dropped in and pasted in this picture. It's false. But here's the thing. Whether or not the Nephilim are real is not our concern. It doesn't affect our lives. But Jude's lesson still does. The point isn't whether angels had sex with women or not. The point is that the story of the angels is teaching us that you can reject God through your actions, and this often begins with lust. And this is pertinent to Jude's letter because there are many people during Jude's time, and this is why Jude is writing this, who were engaging in orgies and all these kinds of different kinds of sex and then claiming Christianity. This is why Jude says this. He says, they are ungodly turning the grace of God into promiscuity. Promiscuity is the Greek word for just random sex acts in the Greek. And these types of Christians, as they call themselves, they claim that we sin... So God has the blessing of forgiving us. Isn't that great? And the more you sin, the more God is glorified. Amen? That's what actually was taught by these folks at this time. But there's a problem with that. You don't understand forgiveness if that's what you think forgiveness is. God is not excited about forgiving us. That's not what Jesus is doing. He wants to forgive us, but forgiveness entails repentance. If I slapped you across the face and I said, hey, I'm sorry, you're like, I forgive you, and then I slap you again, you have every right to question whether I was really sorry about slapping you in the face the first time. And God is the exact same way with us. If you continue to do the things that you repent of, God has the right to go, I don't think you're sorry. If you were actually sorry, you'd try to quit doing that. That's what repentance is. And it's through repentance that we are forgiven. It's not just the act of saying, forgive me, God. And when we act out the sin, it corrupts our faith, which leads us to pride. Pride, if you guys are following along here. In the same way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them committed sexual morality and practiced perversions, just as the angels did. And they serve as an example by undergoing the punishment of eternal fire, And he calls these people dreamers. They defile their flesh. Listen to that action language. They defile their flesh. It's not beliefs, it's actions. Reject authority and they blaspheme the glorious ones. This was the problem of Sodom and Gomorrah. As the story goes, two angels went to visit Lot. Lot allowed these angels to stay with him that night. And as we know the story goes, a whole bunch of people showed up at the house banging on the door demanding that Lot give them the angels so they could have sex with them, so they could rape them. Lot, stupidly, says, take my daughters instead. You can't do this. And before Lot gets any dumber or makes any more mistakes, the angels pushed him aside, blinded the crowd, and then they escaped. That's the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And as they were leaving... Sodom, Gomorrah, and the neighboring cities, it wasn't just Sodom and Gomorrah, it was all those cities in the area were destroyed by fire. 
lust and pride are the lessons that we're supposed to focus on for this example. And as we learned, lust, covetousness, and other sins that tempt us, those, that's lust. But here's the thing, we have a choice to make. Acknowledge we are wrong and repent. So if I come to you with the Bible and I show you the Bible says that how you're living is a sin, you have a choice. Acknowledge God's word, repent, or acknowledge God's word and think to yourself, I know better. God didn't mean that. That was for the first century. That's not for us today. You have that choice to make. And in the case of Sodom and Gomorrah, the people chose to ignore this. Let's look at pride here. Pride. Pride is a feeling of, or deep pleasure or satisfaction derived from one's own, uh, one's own achievements, beliefs, whatever, from your own life. And there's nothing wrong with pride just in and of itself. Pride's neutral. There's nothing wrong with being proud of your kids or proud of your marriage or proud of your accomplishments or even proud of your beliefs. Proud you're an American, proud whatever. But the pride becomes a problem, and this is what the difference between healthy pride and evil pride, pride becomes a problem when you determine that your marriage is good based on your own definitions, not on God's. If you beat your wife into submission and you go, she cooks for me, she cleans for me, she does everything I tell her to do because I put her in her place, that's evil. You might define that as good, but God defines it as evil. If you beat your kids into submission, you might go, hey, my kids listen to everything I say. That's evil. That's your definition of good. That's not God's definition of good. Pride becomes evil when we determine what good is based on our own opinions and not on God's. C.S. Lewis said this, Pride is spiritual cancer. It eats up the very possibility of love or contentment or even common sense. And just as Sodom and Gomorrah are examples that Jude warns us with, this can happen to Christians as well. It's through our pride that we rebel against our God. And all the while, we claim to be Christians. And what happens is, is as we claim the title of Christ, and we continue to act inappropriately, and we act against God's word, we are slowly but surely cutting down that tree of our faith. And it destroys our faith. And if you destroy your faith, if you reject God's word, calling yourself a Christian means nothing. What are you basing Christ on if God's word is not it? This is exactly what happens in Jude's letter here where he talks about they're giving over or committing to sexual immorality. And these are the dreamers that he's talking about, the dreamers. Dreamers, this Greek word is hard to translate, so they just call it dreamers. But what this means is these are people who have, through their emotions and their own opinions and their own thoughts, believe they know better than God's word. The image is, you know, you got, you're struggling over some topic, and you're like, you're reading the Bible, the Bible says X, and you're like, no, I really feel like Y. You go to bed, you have a dream, and then Jesus shows up, and he says, you know what, you're right, the Bible's actually old and archaic. You wake up and go, oh, finally, God agrees with me. Isn't that awesome? That's what the dreamers are doing. The dreamers are determining what God's word says based on their own opinions, their own thoughts, their own beliefs. And Jude is warning us against this. And then also, too, just as a side note, before you look at Sodom and Gomorrah, Christians have this awful, awful tendency to see Sodom and Gomorrah and go, homosexuals, the downfall of society. That's not the text that we're talking about. We see here, Sodom and Gomorrah. It follows the story of the angels having sex with women. And it says, in the same way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities committed sexual perversion, practicing perversion, just as the angels did. The story is, is that here, in, in the story of the angels, they're having sex with women. In this case, they're coming to rape angels. It's the unnaturalness, as he's trying to drive home the fact that it's unnatural for us to want to call ourselves believers, and then act as though we're not. It's unnatural for human beings to want to have sex with angels. Don't try to take one sin in your mind and try to blame all of the world's problems on it. I just, it bothers me to no end when Christians will go protest the gay pride parade. They go home and look at pornography on their computer. 
they go protest the abortion clinic, but they're cheating on their wife. As we learned last week, you are enough work as it is. Worry about yourself. Trim your own tree, as Jesus says. Take the plank out of your own eye. Judge your own fruit and let God judge the world. We're not here to judge. You don't have the right to judge. You don't know what they went through to get, bring them to that place. Addicts and sinners and all these other things that we all come down on. Oh, you're homeless? You must be a loser. You have no idea what they went through to get to that place. The only thing we're called to do is to love on people where they're at. We let the Holy Spirit do the hard work of changing their lives. Number three, rebellion can be subtle, but it lives through our actions. The first thing we see is that people have a tendency to reject authority. Amen? Rebellion is natural to us. It's so natural. How many people have ever had intro to psychology or intro to sociology? Any of those classes will tell you that's just part of the human experience. There's actually a stage in human development that we call rebellion because that's what we tend to do, rebellion. But when it comes to spiritual rebellion, it's a direct result of pride every single time. Because when you rebel against God, you are actively re re going against God's word and you honestly believe that you know better than God's word does when you rebel. It's pride. So before the story of pride, we see this here. The Lord first saved a people out of Egypt. Number one thing is God saves us. The offer is there for everybody. That's the gospel, amen? God saves us. That's the beginning of our faith. You have no faith unless God has come and offered that salvation to you, and he has. It begins with God. And we see in this instance the picture of God's people. They're slaves in Egypt, and they're crying out to God, and they're in slavery because of their own sin. They've made mistakes, and they're in slavery now, and God has mercy on them. He sends Moses to speak his word to them to free the slaves. As we are told in the New Testament, to be freed from the, sin of sl or the slavery of sin. And as the story goes, Pharaoh's pride keeps him from allowing the people to go free. And then God, in the ten plagues of Egypt, each of the plagues pertains to a different God in the Egyptian pantheon. It's a really interesting study. You go through each of the plagues, the sun turns black, the river turns red. All of those are plagues against the gods. Ra, in the middle with the sun, that's the sun god. Moses says, God is going to black out the sun, and in so doing, proving my God is actually more authoritative and bigger and better and higher than your God. He blocks out the sun, usurping the authority of Ra. Then we have the crocodile god. I don't know if he's up there. He's not. Of the Nile. What happened to the Nile? Anybody? It turned to blood. Another opportunity for God to say, not only am I better than your God, I can make your God bleed. All of those were attempts to help Pharaoh see the folly of his ways, but through his pride, he rejects God. But here's the thing. Pharaoh never ever said, I reject God, that we know of. It was through his actions that we know he rebelled against the God of the universe. His pride, his belief that he is right, despite the fact that God is speaking to him via Moses, his pride wrecked his opportunity. And Christians do this all the time. William Barclay says here, he's, this is his commentary on Jude, he says this. He says, we must understand one thing. In the, we're talking about Jude. The evil people in Jude who are corrupting the church did not regard themselves as enemies of the church or Christianity. They regarded themselves as advanced thinkers, a cut above ordinary Christians. They honestly believe they're the spiritual elite. They have some secret message. Those are the dreamers that we're talking about. And here's the thing, Christians, amen, saved by God's grace. We think we're really special. We honestly think that we're way better sometimes, that we know better, that we're more educated, that we're better judges. 
But this is pride, and this pride corrupts us slowly but surely from the inside out as we start to think, not only do I know better than my neighbor, I actually know better than the Bible does sometimes. Oh, the Bible says that's a sin? Eh, maybe back then it was. Now we should accept that as, as it's okay. That was the problem that, that Jude was dealing with. That's why he brings up the Egypt. He brings up the angels, brings up Sodom and Gomorrah. We can't forget the book was not written to the world. It was written to Christians. Before you think that you know better, you're like, well, Pastor Joshua, what do you know? And Jude, yeah, it, it quotes books outside the Bible. What does Jude know? Even Paul deals with this as well. Paul, Paul, 1 Corinthians 10, 5 through 11. Feel free to write that down. Paul, talking about Egypt, he says this. But God was not pleased with most of them, for they were struck down in the wilderness. Now these things became examples for us. They were written down for us to learn from them, so that we will not desire evil things as they did. Don't become idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, here's the action. So here's the belief, the pride. But now here's the action. The people sat down to eat and drink and they got up to play. What he's saying is that they lived their lives, they were good people, but they disregarded God. They just got up, ate, drank, played, did what they wanted to do, didn't acknowledge God the entire time. And he says, let us not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. In a single day, 23,000 fell dead. Let us not test Christ, as some of them did, and were destroyed by snakes. Now we see rebellion entering in through their actions. Their actions resulted in immorality. Their immorality was rebellion, and the rebellion caused them to die and to be destroyed. Nor should we complain, as some of them did. Rebellion again. Now these things happened to them as examples, and they were written down as a warning to us. The Bible is a warning, not for the world, for the Christian. That's why Jude actually says, I want to remind you. He's writing this to the church. He is genuinely scared for the salvation of his own people. Because he knows all too well when we act out our sins, that we start to slowly but surely reject our God. The gospel is simple. Jesus died for our sins. Amen. God accepts us where we're at. The gift of salvation is simple. But living the life of a Christian, maintaining that salvation and continuing on in life is not so easy. This is why Jesus says this. Remember Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light? That's talking about the gospel. But then Jesus doesn't stop there. And most Christians do. Oh, it's easy. Pray a prayer. You're five? Pray that prayer. Save forever. Don't go back to church again. Who cares? Live however you want. Saved. What does Jesus say? He doesn't end right there. Jesus continues and he says, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Strong words. For which of you wanting to build a tower? Imagine you're building a house. He says, which of you wanting to build a, a house, a tower, doesn't first sit down and calculate, count the cost to see if you can actually finish and complete it? Otherwise, after he's laid the foundation, he cannot finish. All the onlookers will look and begin to make fun of him, saying, this guy can't even, he started building, but he never finished. His point is that when the Christian claims the title of Christianity and they reject the lifestyle and they don't try to make progress, God's only looking for progress. He's not looking for us to change overnight. Praise God. None of us are going to make it. But he wants us to make progress. That's what repentance is. Acknowledging that branch that is kind of killing you. Cutting it off. Repenting of it. It hurts. You might make that mistake again. That's okay because God wants you to make progress. He's not expecting perfection. But if you reject God's word, you have no chance of making progress at all. And he says, you need to consider the cost. It's a warning to us. Now this is what follows exactly after this. Now, Jesus says, this is Jesus saying this. Salt is good, but if salt loses its taste, how can it be made salty? It isn't fit for the soil. It isn't fit for the manure pile. What happens to the salt that loses its flavor? It gets thrown away. 
He says, anyone who has ears to hear, let them hear. We are the salt of the world, amen? We are a light to the world, amen? But here's the thing. Both of these images is us bringing the gospel to the world and changing the world around us. The light of the world. We're the lampstand. You know, the church is the lampstand that holds the light. Every single person in here is the light. You go into a dark world for what? To light up the place. You bring something the world does not have. The love of God. Amen. You are the salt of the world. You go to a tasteless, awful place. You bring the flavor and the love of God and you change everything around you because God is flowing through you, through your actions, through showing your love to your neighbor, throwing your, showing your love to your friends. You bring something different. That's how they know you're different. That's why we need to judge our own fruits, as the text says. But, if you go out with your friends and you're not different, are you bringing any light? If you go out with your friends and then you sleep with that girl or that guy or you act like this or act that, you get drunk, you're falling over yourself, you're playing the fool, are you really bringing any flavor? And if you're not, that doesn't mean you don't have faith, but you need to stop and judge your own fruit and ask yourself, Am I bringing a benefit to the world? Or am I exactly the same as the world? Here's the thing. If, if you are not bringing salt to the world, repent. Repent of it. Make progress. Amen? We're all works in progress. Amen? But if you think you're good enough the way you are, repent. Because Jesus tells us very clearly, why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who's good. Then Jesus doesn't end there. If you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Neighbor as yourself and love the Lord God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, all your spirit. Those are actions. Jesus tells us, no one is good. No one. You're not good enough. Nobody's good enough. God just expects us to make progress. And that's glorious. That means that at the age of 80, you still have more to learn. It means at the age of 90, you still have more to learn. We always have more to learn. We always have more to grow. And then he tells us, Jesus tells us, well, how do we do this? By applying God's word to our lives and growing in our faith producing the fruit that others can come along and pluck and eat and enjoy the love of God. These are words of action. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for being so gracious, so merciful. You're so good to us. We pray, God, that you would help every single one of us here. We're all works in progress, Lord. We praise you for the opportunity to love you no matter where we are. We ask, God, that every single one of us here would have our eyes opened so we could see where we could be changing our lives and making progress. Help us to understand your truth. Help us to understand how to apply your truth to our lives and help us to, to know better how to reach our neighbors and our friends. Oh, Lord, we would love so very much to be able to share the love that you give us to those around us. And we ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would fill us, that your Holy Spirit and that love would overflow our cup and just infect the lives around us. Water those trees, those seeds that you've planted. We praise you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen.